Abbas ibn Abd al-Muttalib, one of Muhammad's youngest uncles, went on to inspire the revolutionary movement led by his descendants, the Abbasids. Empathizing their due right and rightful claim to the caliphal throne, currently held by the Umayyad dynasty in Damascus, the enigmatic Abu Muslim played a crucial role in orchestrating the plot to overthrow them, employing meticulous planning and astute political maneuvering to undermine Umayyad authority and establish Abbasid rule. The emergence of the Abbasid revolution in the hinterlands of the caliphate's province of Khorasan in modern-day Iran gained significant momentum by the year 747 with the help of Shia Arabs and local Persians. By the 8th century, the Umayyad caliphs established a dreadful reputation for being ruthless, impious, and cruel. During the 92-year reign of the Umayyads, the emphasis shifted from Tawhid, the all-encompassing component of the Islamic faith, to money and power. The caliphs lost their spiritual claim to rule as they grew more preoccupied with collecting taxes to fund their lavish lifestyle. With this backdrop in mind, it is easy to see why the Umayyad Caliph, Marwan II, ordered the capture and killing of Ibrahim, head of the Abbasid clan, to curb the Abbasid movement. This deed, however, only fueled the determination of Ibrahim's younger brother, Abu Abbas, who took command and promised vengeance. In 750, the bulk of the Abbasid armies led by Abu Abbas attacked Marwan's army near the greater Zab River. The caliph's army left the battlefield in terror, handing the Abbasids a decisive victory. Marwan was finally apprehended and executed, along with the great majority of his Umayyad family, who were also apprehended and killed. Only the young prince Abd al-Rahman fled and took control of Umayyad al-Andalus in Spain. In the city of Kufa, Abu Abbas as Safa was proclaimed caliph, gaining control of the caliphate once held by the Umayyads except for the empire's westernmost holdings. Before the year 762, the Fertile Crescent's rivers and floodplains were home to the capitals of various empires, including Babylonia and Ctesiphon. Under al-Mansur, the second caliph of the Abbasid dynasty, Baghdad, a Persian hamlet on the Tigris River, was chosen as the capital of the Abbasid Caliphate. The construction of Baghdad, known as Madinat al-Salam, or City of Peace, involved the creation of a circular walled city referred to as the Round City. Serving primarily as a governmental complex rather than a residential area, it spanned approximately 3,000 yards or 2,700 meters in diameter and featured three concentric walls. The city was divided into four equal quarters, used for accommodating the caliph's entourage. In the center was the caliph's palace and grand mosque. Due to the limited space within the city walls, rapid expansion occurred beyond its confines. Traders and merchants erected bazaars and residences near the southern gate, forming what is now known as the al Kark district. Additionally, a bridge of boats facilitated transportation and trade over to the eastern bank of the Tigris. Baghdad quickly became a cosmopolitan metropolis that rivaled even its largest European contemporaries. Despite this accomplishment, Al-Mansur was similar to his brother and predecessor in that he too unleashed the terrible savagery of the Abbasids, this time on Ali's bloodline. He purposely encouraged them into revolt, mistaking them for conspirators planning against his power, only to violently smash the movement. Even Abu Muslim, the man credited with creating the Abbasid dynasty, came under Al-Mansur's wrath as his authority rose. With Al-Mansur's death in 775 came Al-Mahdi, who quickly got to work rectifying the injustices committed by his father against Ali's lineage, liberating their captives and generously compensating them. Harun al-Rashid, the fifth Abbasid caliph, inheriting the title in 786, propelled the Abbasid caliphate and the city of Baghdad into untold heights of prosperity and power. His unwavering commitment to the advancement of arts and knowledge epitomized his vision for Muslims to take the lead on a global scale. To realize this vision, he established the illustrious Bayt al-Hikmah in Baghdad, also known as the House of Wisdom, which gathered scholars and intellectuals from all over the world to play a pivotal role in translating classical Greek, 
Indian, Chinese, and Persian works of antiquity into Arabic. Under Harun's reign, a golden age of learning emerged in Islam, where ideas and thought regarding the sciences, technology, philosophy, literature, mathematics, economics, and the arts ascended to new highs. The invention of paper transformed knowledge distribution, allowing individuals to earn a career by making and selling books. Papermaking originated in China and spread to the caliphate in the 8th century, eventually reaching Spain and the rest of Europe by the 10th. Paper outperformed parchment and papyrus because it was less prone to breaking and capable of absorbing ink, making erasure harder and serving as an excellent medium for record keeping. The Book of 1001 Nights, which took shape in the 10th century and reached its final form by the 14th century, was one of the most famous literary works created during the Islamic Golden Age. Although the quantity and type of its tales varied, it was a compilation of many older Arabic and Persian folk tales that acted as a significant piece of work in the West by spreading imagination about Arabic and Persian mythology. With the emergence of information came an influx of Muslim polymath intellectuals who made significant contributions to the Islamic Golden Age. Polymaths often possessed extensive knowledge across numerous fields, and with this knowledge came a surge of learning in the sciences and mathematics. Ibn al-Haytham's groundbreaking contributions to experimental physics contributed novel features to the scientific method. His important work, the Book of Optics, resulted in fundamental optics changes. Notably, he empirically demonstrated that vision is caused by light rays entering the eye, and he even invented the camera obscura to demonstrate the physical qualities of light rays. Through his famous book, Kitab al-Jabr wal-Mukabala, the Persian scholar Muhammad ibn Musa al-Khwarizmi made significant advances in algebra, from whence the name algebra came. Al-Khwarizmi was also instrumental in spreading Arabic numbers and the Hindu-Arabic numeral system outside the Indian subcontinent. Al-Haytham is also credited with discovering the sum formula for the fourth power in the field of calculus. Notably, this approach may be easily expanded to calculate the total for any integral power, and Al-Haytham successfully used it to calculate the volume of a paraboloid. Numerous other mathematical advances that occurred during the Islamic Golden Age included the invention of spherical trigonometry, the addition of decimal point notation to Arabic numerals, the invention of all trigonometric functions other than sine, the beginning of algebraic geometry, and the first attempts at non-Euclidean geometry. Ibn Rushd had an important role in preserving and spreading Aristotle's writings, molding secular thought in Christian and Muslim countries with Averroism philosophy. His publications and comments were essential in advancing secular philosophy in Western Europe, proposing the notion of existence precedes essence. Ibn Tufail's philosophical book, Hai Ibn Yaqdan, or Philosophes Autodidactus, had a significant influence on modern philosophy. Empiricism, tabula rasa, nature versus nurture, condition of possibility, materialism, and Molyneux's problem were among the subjects tackled in the work. This book influenced future European intellectuals such as John Locke, Gottfried Leibniz, and Christian Huygens. Other Muslim thinkers made their mark as well. Ibn al-Haytham, the polymath that he is, contributed to phenomenology and criticized Aristotelian natural philosophy. The illuminationist physiology of Shahab al-Din Surawardi asserted that light acts at all levels and hierarchies of existence. Building on the work of ancient Greek and Roman physicians such as Hippocrates, Dioscorides, and Serenus, Muslim physicians made significant contributions to anatomy, experimental medicine, ophthalmology, pathology, pharmaceutical sciences, physiology, and surgery. They founded the first specialized hospitals, medical schools, and psychiatric facilities. Through his Kitab al-Tasrif, Abu al-Qasim advanced contemporary surgery by introducing several surgical devices and methods. Ibn Sina's work helped to find and contain infectious illnesses, to introduce experimental medicine and evidence-based practices, and to better comprehend bacteria and viral species. 
Ibn Khatima and Ibn al-Khatib discovered that infectious disorders were caused by microbes, while Mansur Ibn Ilyas created detailed schematics of the body's anatomical, neurological, and circulatory systems. Ibn al-Ubudi discovered groundbreaking information on the body's need for blood. The Moraga school's achievements in astronomy constitute a significant Moraga revolution, with their contributions encompassing a wide variety of developments. During the time of Caliph al-Mamun, the Moraga school erected the first observatory in Baghdad. They collected and corrected astronomical data systematically, effectively resolving significant flaws within the Ptolemaic model. Their foresight established the groundwork for astrophysics and celestial mechanics, unveiling the basic rules that govern celestial bodies and Earth. In contrast to Ptolemy's geocentric model, which argued that the universe and solar system revolved around the Earth, numerous Muslim astronomers considered Earth's rotation on its axis and the possibility of a heliocentric solar system, the idea that the universe revolves around the Sun. During the Islamic Golden Age, there was an agricultural breakthrough known as the Arab Agricultural Revolution. Muslim traders aided in the spread of crops and farming practices throughout the Islamic world by bringing new plants and technologies from Africa, China, and India. Significant changes occurred in the economy, population distribution, agricultural productivity, and other facets of life as a result of this. Sugar production became a large-scale enterprise, and cash farming and crop rotation schemes were established. Muslims used complex agricultural rotation systems, efficient irrigation techniques, and a diverse choice of crops cataloged based on seasonal compatibility, soil type, and water requirements. To power mills and industries, hydropower, tidal power, and wind power were harnessed. Water mills were used as early as the 7th century, and many types of mills, such as fulling mills, grist mills, sawmills, and windmills were used. Crankshafts, water turbines, and gears were devised by Muslim engineers, and dams were used to provide extra water power. During this time, industries included astronomy, ceramics, chemistry, distillation, clocks, glass, equipment driven by water and wind, textiles, mining, and more, with their skills progressively spreading throughout Europe via translated writings. The Abbasid Caliphate's labor force was made up of people from varied origins, and both men and women worked in a variety of jobs across many industries. Slavery played an important role in the Islamic world's economic life, with slaves working in salt mines and plantations, household chores and military and civic duty. With all of this wealth being created, a market economy and merchant capitalism emerged. The adoption of a uniform currency, the dinar, enabled the widespread usage of many business strategies and organizations. Early contracts, bills of exchange, long-distance trade, credit and debt systems, capital accumulation, banking practices such as checks and promissory notes, trusts, savings, and transactional accounts, pawning, exchange rates, ledgers, and double-entry bookkeeping were all examples of these. There were also autonomous organizational firms that ran independently of the state. Many of these proto-capitalist ideas were subsequently pushed in medieval Europe beginning in the 13th century. Baghdad's strategic location between Africa, Europe, and Asia enabled these merchants, traders, and travelers to journey to and from the imperial capital along major trade routes that crisscrossed the Abbasid Caliphate. Muslim traders wielded enormous power over African Arabic and Arabian Asian trade networks. As a result of its mercantile commerce, Islamic civilization thrived and spread. Merchants conveyed commodities, beliefs, and ideas from the Islamic Golden Age to China, India, Southeast Asia, and Western African kingdoms, and returned with innovations. Sufi missionaries also played an important role in the growth of Islam by spreading their message to these parts of the world. However, the seeds of the Islamic Golden Age's demise, and therefore the Abbasid Caliphate, were sown by its first patron style of governing. Harun delegated control to educated and competent persons, while he was busy laying the foundations of the Caliphate's prosperity. As a result, power dynamics shifted dramatically. 
While the caliphs had previously exercised unrivaled rule over the whole Islamic realm, this changed when Ibrahim Ibn Aglab, a seasoned statesman, suggested to Harun in the year 800 that in exchange for autonomy, he'd have Ifriqiya be handed to him and his family as a principality, while also vowing loyalty to the caliph and giving an annual tribute. Unbeknownst to Harun, accepting this deal laid the stage for a protracted period of disintegration. Harun also faced a new significant challenge in his family, developing a succession strategy. While he preferred Al-Amin, he sought to spread authority among both of his sons, naming Al-Mamun as a junior ruler and designated successor. Unfortunately, this strategy was doomed to fail. The fourth fitna erupted following Harun's death in 809 and spread throughout the caliphate, plunging it into a state of turmoil. Initially, Al-Amin had the upper hand, but he lost significant defeats, leaving Baghdad as his solitary stronghold. After a protracted siege by Al-Mamun's soldiers, Al-Amin chose to surrender. However, while in prison, he met a cruel end at the hands of renegade Persian troops. Deeply resentful at his brother's murder, Al-Mamun adopted Al-Amin's boys and swiftly pursued justice against the perpetrators. Al-Mamun, who ascended to the caliphate in 813, reigned over the peak of the Islamic Golden Age. However, this period was brief. Despite his father's greater enthusiasm for the arts and scholarship, Al-Mamun's tendency towards social rationalization, including the problematic proposal of rewriting or modifying the Quran, defied many Muslims' basic beliefs. After al-Mamun's passing in 833, the seeds planted by Harun began to sprout. The Abbasid Caliphate experienced a prolonged period of degradation. Al-Mamun's immediate successors, al-Mutasim and al-Wathiq, were the first to experience it. The collapse of their temporal power began with al-Mutasim's decision to include non-Muslim Berber, Slavic, and Turkish mercenaries as personal bodyguards. While these warriors were converted to Islam, the empire's uniting temporal foundation was eroded. As a result, several military generals quickly seized control of the caliphate by assassinating any caliph who rejected their demands. When the 10th Abbasid caliph, al-Mutawakil, was slain after a Turkish-instigated court coup d'etat in 861, Abbasid control was destroyed. This incident gave the Turks unparalleled authority over al-Muntasir, al-Mutawakil's son, who was installed as a mere puppet on the throne but died soon after. Political anarchy in Baghdad was combined with the fact that regional governors increasingly sought to establish hereditary positions, therefore demanding more autonomy. The Shia Idrisids rose to prominence in Morocco in 793. By the 860s, Egyptian administrators had founded the Tulunid Emirate, breaking away from the caliphate and eventually gaining control of Palestine and the Hejaz. Simultaneously, governors in the eastern provinces began to cut connections with central Abbasid authority. In the 870s, the Safarids of Herat and the Samanids of Bukhara seceded, attempting to establish a unique Persian culture and rule. By the year 900, the Abbasids controlled only central Mesopotamia. In 909, a pivotal turning point occurred when the Shia leader, Ubaid Allah al-Mahdi Billah, from the Fatimid dynasty, asserted his lineage as a descendant of Muhammad's daughter and proclaimed himself as the legitimate caliph. They progressively gained control over the Idrisi in Morocco and the Aglabids in North Africa, ultimately triumphant in reaching Egypt in 969. They established their seat of power near Fustat in Cairo, a city purposely constructed as a stronghold for Shia scholarship and political influence. From Cairo, they took the Levant and eventually the Hejaz, with the holy cities of Medina and Mecca with it. Additionally, in 929, the Umayyad Emirate of Cordoba in Spain declared itself a caliphate, challenging the authority and legitimacy of both the Abbasids in Baghdad and the Fatimids in North Africa. The greatest severe humiliation for the Abbasids, however, came with the establishment of another Shia faction, the Buyids. 
Ali ibn Buya created his Iranian-based Shia dynasty with his crowning achievement of taking Baghdad in 945 and demanding that the Abbasids recognize them as the only rulers of the land they held. This change was just another shift of the dominant party in the eyes of the Abbasids. The Bayids, too, were doomed to invasion. As nomads from the Central Asian steppes, the Seljuk Turks wreaked havoc on the Bayids. These Turks, who had adopted Sunni Islam while retaining certain pre-Islamic characteristics, swiftly conquered vast territories from Central Asia to Anatolia. In 1055, Tugril Beg seized Baghdad, ousting the Buyids from the capital. The Abbasid caliphs continued to be manipulated by successive puppeteers. Throughout the 11th century, the Seljuks initially dominated as a powerful force, but their strength waned towards the end of the century. When European nobles arrived in the Holy Land in 1096, attracted to calls of crusade, the Seljuks were weakened and unable to resist. The Abbasids were ineffective in the face of the Seljuk decline. Saladin, the illustrious Kurdish general, rose to prominence in Egypt, bringing former Fatimid provinces under his Ayyubid rule. He devoted himself to holy war against the Crusaders, winning a decisive victory in the Battle of Hatton in 1187. The Crusaders never fully recovered and were finally ejected from the Holy Land in 1291 by the Mamluk Sultanate, which had supplanted Saladin's Ayyubid dynasty in Egypt nearly half a century prior. The Abbasids were able to recover their military and temporal sovereignty in Baghdad during the Crusades, declaring their independence in the 1150s. In 1157, the Seljuks, enraged by this bold move, besieged Baghdad but failed to seize it. The Abbasids were then able to further their status by expanding their power in Mesopotamia and portions of Persia. The newfound independence of the Caliphate faced a grave threat in the 13th century from the Mongols, who, under the leadership of Genghis Khan, had emerged as a formidable power from Central Asia. Genghis Khan would die in 1227, but this did not dampen the Mongolian onslaught of brutal, merciless conquest into Persia, China, and into modern-day Russia, where they also attempted to invade Poland and Hungary. Hulagu Khan, a grandson of Genghis, was tasked with building upon the Mongolian invasion of Persia. In the winter of 1257, Hulagu marched towards Baghdad, the Abbasids failing to muster up a properly organized defense. However, Hulagu gave the Abbasids a chance at peaceful surrender. When al-Mustasim, the 37th Abbasid Caliph, refused this chance at survival, a brutal siege of the city ensued. The city of Baghdad succumbed in the June of 1258. More than a million people were killed the next week. Al-Mustasim, wrapped in a carpet, was beaten with clubs and trampled to death by Mongol horses. Mosques were demolished. Libraries were destroyed, including the Great House of Wisdom and its hundreds of thousands of texts. Great thinkers were tortured to death. Artisans, craftspeople, and engineers were enslaved. Women were dragged, tortured, and abandoned on remote roads. The dams erected by the Abbasids on the Tigris and Euphrates were dismantled. Baghdad, once the world's greatest metropolis, became a ghost town. The Abbasid Caliphate, once the world's greatest empire, annihilated. The fall of Baghdad in the summer of 1258 also marked the end of the Islamic Golden Age. For 600 years, Baghdad and the Islamic Golden Age served as an illuminating force, upholding knowledge, art, and culture, serving as one of the many catalysts for Europe's renaissance in the coming centuries. Hulagu Khan resumed his conquests, subjugating the entirety of Iraq and taking Aleppo in Syria. Nonetheless, the Mamluk Sultanate effectively halted the Mongol march into the rest of Islam, winning a decisive victory in the Battle of Ain Jalut in 1260. Finally, in 1517, Sultan Selim I of the Ottoman Sultanate crushed the Mamluks, gaining their domains and taking the caliphal title for his dynasty.